Good morning, church family. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see all of you here this morning. As we uh, rejoice in this day that the Lord has made, and let us be glad in it. And we can be glad because of the gift of love that Jesus has given to each and every one of us. Sometimes we experience that love in praises and in joy. Sometimes we experience that love through sorrow and pain and suffering, sometimes through selfless sacrifice that we have all have seen and known in Christ Jesus and experienced that in our lives. But also on this day, we experience the gift of love and remembrance as those who sought to seek and save the lost on that day of 9-11. And to them, we lift up our hearts with gratitude that we may follow in their example and in their witness that Jesus has given us as our good shepherd comes to seek and save us when we're lost. This morning, uh, I draw your attention to the bulletin uh, for announcements. Um, we will be beginning our adult uh, small group uh, this Friday, uh, the 16th at 7 p.m. Uh, over at the church parsonage. So if you're interested, uh, please come see me. Please talk to Sarah if you need directions. We'll be more than happy to give that to you. Uh, and uh, if you're able, uh, please let us know of any uh, dietary restrictions so that we can uh, plan to have a snack uh, accordingly to the, so we can celebrate together. Uh, also, uh, this Tuesday at 6.30 is the final Adventist meeting uh, that we will be having uh, over in the church house uh, before uh, our big festivities kick off. And so, uh, please do your best to be there. Uh, and if not, uh, Diane has promised that she will uh, come to find you now. <laughs> um, but it, it'll be a great time to, to all be together and to kind of uh, uh, work the remaining details out and to uh, make sure that this uh, Apple Fest is a huge success for us and for uh, the law days that we're celebrating alongside. Also, um, choir practice has started uh, 6.30 on Thursdays. If you are interested in joining the choir, please see Donna and know she'll be happy to have an email who are interested in, in doing that, as well as the prayer group and the uh, front porch group that meets on Mondays uh, at those times listed there. Any other announcements for the good of the church at this time? We have Ragamuffin. Ragamuffin starts tomorrow at 1.30. Ragamuffin is tomorrow at 1.30. Uh, so if you are interested in, in being a part of the Ragamuffin group, uh, you can see Doris or any of those uh, who are a part of that. And we can uh, get you going in the right direction. The first and third Monday of the month. Any others? I just have a question about the water sale. I don't know who's heading that up, but when do we have the love of everything here? That is a great question. The week of the water sale. The Monday through Friday. Okay. okay. Which is when? Um, the morning goes on the 15th, the 17th, that Monday through the 14th. Okay. So the 15th and 17th is the rummage sale. So anytime uh, that week, you know? Just the 15th. Get it straight now. <laughs> so anytime that week, uh, you can uh, start a month. Yeah, really. Right. Right. Any other announcements? Any other
ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord with the splendor of his holy voice. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Our hymn of praise this morning is Grace Greater Than Our Sin. It's in the hymnal on page 365. We're just going to do verses 1 and 4. I tend to lose my keys a lot. 
Uh, usually when I walk out the door, Sarah always double checks phone, keys, wallet, uh, in any of those orders, but the keys are the ones that seem to be uh, going missing the most. And the keys are important for me. I have lots of keys here. I've got <laughs> some that are for my house. I've got some for my cars at home. I've got some for the church office here and uh, various doors here in the church. And, and, and some uh, for other things that I need keys to get into. And so um, each of these are special and unique for each of the purposes that they've been designed for. Right? If I, I can't get into the front door of my house with my car keys, can I? Or at least I should. <laughs> but uh, e each of the keys uh, are enable me to do what I need to do and to go to where I need to go. And, and when I lose my keys, that's not a really good feeling. Uh, and so when I go out the door, I have to make sure I have them. Uh, and when they're lost, do I just wish that they return and they come back automatically? I have to go find them, right? Well, in our uh, Bible passage today, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, a couple stories where some uh, things, some valuable things get lost. We're going to talk about some lost sheep and a lost coin. And we might not always uh, have money with us, we might not uh, ever be owners of sheep, but we all know, I think, at one point in our lives or another, what it's like to lose something uh, of value and worth. And so, um, in our story, there's in particular some religious folk that uh, are, uh, don't think that others uh, belong where Jesus is. They don't think that Jesus uh, is right in being their friend. And they feel that it looks bad on Jesus' part to associate with them. And they talk about these people in terms of being lost. Sometimes I feel lost as a person. And, and yet, you know what the good news is? Is that God just doesn't sit back and say, well, you're lost. Too bad, so sad for you. God comes searching for us. And he doesn't stop searching until we're found. Because all of us are valuable. All of us are unique. All of us have a purpose in God's kingdom. And God never likes to see us lost. And so, uh, when Jesus comes to look for us, and we say yes to him when he finds us, God rejoices. And not just God, but all of heaven. And that's a great thing for us to rejoice into when we're lost and God comes to find us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you never stop looking for us. No matter how far away from you we've gone, you come to seek you come to embrace. You come to carry us on your shoulders so that we might return home to you and with you. And this gives us all the reason to rejoice for your great love for us. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray.
Thank you, Lord. At this time, I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward as we prepare for the giving and receiving of our tithes and offerings. Ashley's um, C-section is not infected. It's just taking a while longer to heal. 
her prayers for Trevor's grandma who um, passed away. That's just how you for lung cancer. And the storyteller from the Renaissance Fair, I say it right, Temujin, Temujin was his first name. He passed away. He passed away. He passed away. He passed away. So continued prayers for Ashley and Trevor's grandma and what was the rest of them? Timogen. He's from Africa. Timogen. I think that's what his name is. So all of those we lift up in our prayers this day. Others. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, this 
so much hate, so much violence, and so much division, and we especially saw that on 9-11. But Lord, as we remember that day, we thank you for those who acted in selfless sacrifice, the first responders, the ambulance workers, the police officers,
We're going to continue right along in Luke's uh, gospel account. Uh, this morning we're in chapter 15, and we'll be focusing on the first 10 verses. So when you find your place, I invite you to rise for the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lost one of them, does not leave the other ninety-nine in the open country, and go after the one that is lost, until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and diligently seek until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Beloved, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Gracious God, we thank you for your word this morning. We ask that you would open our ears and our hearts and our minds and our lives to receive your word, what you would want to speak and do through us this day. I ask, Lord, that nothing I might say would get in the way of all the things that you would want to say and do in the life of this church, in the lives of your people. And so we invite you, Lord, to come, be in this place. Open us to a posture ready to receive you, and willing to serve you, in faithful obedience to Jesus Christ, our living Lord and our Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Jesus concluded his last teaching in chapter 14 with these words. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus was instructing the crowds gathering around him, not only on what being a disciple meant, but on how a follower of Jesus conforms their life to live within God's kingdom. Namely, a follower of Jesus must reorder their life to live in such a way that says, I'm not going to merely tell you that I'm a disciple of Jesus, but I'm going to demonstrate by the way I live my life that I am one of his own. That to me, Jesus is worth all the living because he came and rescued me when I was least deserving, when I was helpless and powerless to choose him on my own. And yet, because he loved me, he chose me. He pursued after me when I was lost. And now I am found. And now I owe him everything. And I want you to be found too. In other words, this invitation of discipleship that Jesus lays before the crowd and lays before us all is one of a radically transformed life. Then, just as much as now, living as a disciple was a costly decision that required great humility and total dependency on Christ. It required continual courage and selfless sacrifice that could only come from Jesus. And as we learned last time from Jesus' teaching, being one of his disciples may mean that no matter what the cost, we must go all in. We must be willing to go all in. And in doing so, we may find ourselves at times at a crossroads of choosing between Jesus and the relationships within our circles. We may find ourselves enduring seasons of hardship and suffering, either for us specifically or enduring on behalf of another. We may find it necessary 
to detach ourselves from our possessions, our own personal agendas that we all once held dear and so important so that in Christ we may possess his forgiveness and be found for his redemptive eternal peace. So whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. These are perhaps familiar words to us. And we can find them recorded throughout Mark, Matthew, and Luke as part of Jesus' teachings. And often we see them preceding or following one of Jesus' parables. And as I said earlier in the children's message, we can think of a parable of a story that comes out of our everyday life. It's simply an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And today we encounter the lost sheep and the lost coin, two of the five parables that are right within the heart of Luke's gospel. The parables that Jesus gave to the crowds following him aren't complex by any means, and they would have been teachings that anyone who had listened would have understood. And perhaps that's exactly what sometimes gives off the illusion of difficulty as we read them, that anyone can hear what Jesus is saying, but how many understand even more, how many are willing to follow through with what Jesus is saying? Jesus' parables were meant just as much for the farmer as they were the lawyer or the theological expert. But in order to hear, we must have the ears to hear. And that's sometimes the irony of the parable. That sometimes the temptation is to think that because there's this great heavenly meaning attached to such a simple story that we can't begin to understand its truth unless we make it drastically more complex than it's intended. And because of that, both the Pharisee and the peasant are at risk of an even greater danger that thinking because of our life situation or our standing before God, we're the ones to which the parable need not apply. And so in Luke 15, we begin to see how the crowd responds to Jesus' invitation for committed disciples. And Luke tells us that it's the tax collectors and the sinners who are rising up out of the background of the crowd and are coming closer. They are the ones drawing near not only to hear Jesus' words, but to draw near to Jesus himself. And now this raises the eyebrows of the religious elite for a couple reasons. For the devout Jew, if there were two groups of people that one should never come in contact with, public or private, it was the tax collector and the sinner. The simple word for tax collector was sellout. These guys were, themselves were Jews who worked for the Roman authorities, and essentially they bought their position from Rome to collect from the people what the government required. This was a power position that was often infiltrated with corruption. And so Rome said to these tax collectors, this is the amount we acquired, required. You must collect this amount from everyone. Anything that you choose to collect above and beyond that, you may keep for yourself. And so as you might guess, fees well exceeded over the bare minimum and fluctuated depending on the mood of the day. So to the people of Israel, the tax collectors were dirty. They were filthy. They were rotten, they were low down, they were no good, liars and cheaters and swindlers and traitors and any other derogatory euphemism you want to throw out there. To engage with tax collectors in any casual encounter was seen as socially unacceptable. And on equal footing, or maybe even slightly higher footing than the tax collectors, were the sinners. They were the ones who the Pharisees and said, the scribes felt they needed to get their act together, to clean up a little bit. Sinners were the ones who were unable to maintain the purity laws that were required for the people of God. And it could have been because of lifestyle, it could have been because of gender, it could have been because of sickness or disease or other infirmities, it could have been because of an undealt sin in someone's life, it could have been due to pure rebellion or ignorance. But sinners were labeled. They were outcasted. They were condemned. And so for the devout Jew, the fear was that to interact with these folk in any way 
was to take on their spiritual uncleanliness as their own. But there's another category of persons also under this label of sinner. And these are, in essence, Gentiles. And the Jew often referred to Gentiles or worldly people beyond Israelite lineage as people of the land. In his commentary on Blues, William Barclay records some of the Pharisaic uh, regulations prohibiting interactions between devout Jews and the people of the land. And so he shares some of those. He says, when a man encounters one of the people of the land, entrust to him no money, take no testimony from him, trust him with no secret, do not appoint, appoint him guardian of an orphan, do not make him custodian of charitable funds, do not accompany him on a journey. And so you can see what kind of predicament this creates in the minds of the Pharisees and scribes when they see the tax collectors and sinners responding to Jesus in the way that they were. Not only were they listening, but they were drawing near. They were receiving Jesus' teaching as if to say, yes, Jesus, what you're offering is exactly what I need, and so tell me more. And he was receiving them. But of the Pharisees and the scribes present, those who are the highly trained religious experts in the Jewish law and scriptures, they should have known. But where were they? They weren't coming forward. They're standing back, arms crossed, eyes glazed over, backs up against the wall, muttering against with themselves. This man receives sinners and eats with them. What a statement is that? This man receives sinners and eats with them. I don't know if you sense the irony here, but condensed as it may be, this is the very movement of the gospel, isn't it? And yet what's being said here by the Pharisees and scribes is not in any way, shape, or form a statement of praise. The Pharisees and scribes are perturbed. They're ticked off. And they can't stand the fact that this Jesus, a devout Jew who is asserting himself as a miracle worker and a teacher and a healer, is keeping the kind of company that he does. To the religious elite, Jesus is a joke and an embarrassment. But even so, we might be reminded of, of what happened earlier. Back in chapter 5, after performing an extraordinary healing, Jesus goes out. Really, I think it's just one sentence that Luke writes. Jesus goes out, sees this guy named Levi. We know him as Matthew. And Levi is one of those tax collector dudes that you shouldn't be associating with. And Jesus comes up to his cubicle at the, the Roman occupied HR block or whatever uh, organization you want to call it. And it says, Hey, Levi, you're done here. Follow me. Jesus is the one that chooses Levi to be one of the twelve. And Levi drops everything right then and there and follows Jesus as his disciple. And not only does Jesus does Levi follow Jesus, he honors him by throwing Jesus a feast at his house with this huge crowd of tax collectors, and there's Jesus reclining at the table with all of them. And what do the Pharisees say to Jesus' disciples? Same thing they said here in chapter 15. Grumbling, they mutter, why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? And I bet Jesus overheard it, and he jumped in to intercede before they could even respond. And he says in 531, to those who are well, who have no need of physician, I have not come, but to the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus was turning an upside down world right side up. And those who heard his message clearly were offering themselves to him wholeheartedly. Repent.
repentance, not religion, was the sign of a disciple whose life had been radically transformed by Jesus. And for that, there is every reason to rejoice in heaven and on earth. As we talked about many times already, Jesus is on a mission to seek and save the lost as he makes his way toward Jerusalem. But not everyone receives him openly or readily. And those who provide the most resistance come from the overtly religious. And there are others in everyday throngs of life who add to that complication, that add to that conflict and opposition. But nonetheless, those who should have understood who Jesus was from the very start are now showing themselves a little hard of hearing to Jesus' invitation to receive life within the kingdom of God. And so we see this role reversal of an upside-down world coming right side up. That those who are cast to the outside of the community of faith are now, because of Jesus, on the inside. And those who are on the inside spheres of religious influence and power are now living outside the kingdom of God. Not because they didn't belong there, but because their hardness of heart prevented them from entering in the first place. This is what makes Jesus' mission and message so punchy. Because we're dealing with people, honest people, sometimes, who, who, who want to love God and serve God out of their lives of faith with purpose and meaning and fulfillment. But Jesus isn't one to settle for the status quo. He's not a party player. He doesn't always follow rules neat and tidily. Nor is he a program guy. And sure, there are certain practices of life and of faith that he observes regularly. And after all, Jesus is a devout Jew himself. But his connection to God, his relationship with his Father in heaven, is not... It's all tied up in the relationship, not his Jewishness. And Jesus has come to seek and save, return those who are lost, those who will receive him with ears to hear. And so it's to the Pharisees and scribes he tells these two parables in our text, which are significant. Because normally when we hear these parables, we think of them as evangelistic stories. We think of these stories in terms of who had been living far off from God and now have a grand welcome home. And we think of these stories of how gracious and wide God's love is. We think of those that God welcomes home who are far off and lost and are needing saved, needing to be brought back within God's kingdom. And that is true. Perhaps more than we realize, though, when we think of these parables, we view the targets aimed for them. They, those out there, outside of kingdom living. But who is Jesus telling the parable to? Not to the tax collectors and sinners, to the Pharisees and the scribes. Those who assert themselves as already belonging to the kingdom of God. Those who already consider themselves healthy and clean and righteous. Those who feel for one another, for one reason or another, they don't need to come before the throne of God in humility and in brokenness and cry out for the kind of repentance Jesus is calling for. They are the ones who are lost and are exactly despite of that the ones Jesus also has come to seek and save, if they're willing. And that's what Jesus is getting at. That's why he says, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. He's not teaching the people a nice little fact. He's not giving them an interesting tidbit that can be stuffed in a pocket and pulled out later for trivia night. Jesus is inviting us into a radically transformed life. He's offering to us, calling out to us, so that in hearing his voice and following his lead, we can return home into his kingdom, rejoicing and joining in the heavenly party that awaits. Beloved, we're all created by a good God who loves us. 
And this good and loving God created each and every person to be in relationship with Him. And this was His perfect design from the beginning of time. But unfortunately, something entered the world that deceived us and turned us to our own way, causing us not to desire that relationship. It's a not-so-small word called sin. Sin not only affects our minds and our hearts, but sin also infiltrates through our actions and our thoughts as well. And the lure of sin has its uh, effect on our relationship with God and the life that we're meant to live within God's kingdom. Sin doesn't give life. It destroys life. And sin before God causes us to be lost in its wilderness. But you see, sin isn't the only uh, act that grieves God's heart. Our, our, our state of lostness, our state of fallenness, is something that we're all born into when we're conceived. From the very first humans created by God, Adam and Eve's stumblings in the garden set off an ongoing intergenerational inheritance of sin for all of humanity. Not one of us is born sinless. Not one of us is righteous enough to find our way back home. But this is the good news. That as you read through the Bible from beginning to end, you'll see that God is a God who always comes to seek and save the lost. And in fact, while Adam and Eve were still in the garden, God pursued. In Genesis 3, 9, God called out from the garden, Where are you? throughout the pages of Scripture and God's faithfulness to His people through His covenant. It is the same call that the Lord Jesus has for each and every one of us today. Even in our times of being lost, God still pursues. In the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and in the book of Revelation, Jesus offers us both His invitation and His promise. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. So whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says. Hearing and responding to God's call has to come from outside of ourselves to completely free us. Otherwise, we'll find ourselves being thrown tossed back and forth between the chaos of life and our lostness without any hope. True grace and peace and being found must only come from God. There was a time in my life when I was lost. I was hurt and alone. It was in my junior year of high school when one of my closest childhood friends passed away. Jeremy and his family were swimming in the ocean when a riptide came in. His mom and his sister were able to make it back to the shore. But once he heard his dad calling for help, Jeremy attempted to save his dad's life. Both Jeremy and his dad drowned. And that night after receiving the phone call, I became angry. I became bitter. And I wasn't sure that I could ever trust him. And so in the emotional upheaval of losing someone so close, I too became lost. But even in the midst of this terrible tragedy, God revealed just how far he would go to prove that he is a seeking and saving God. Shortly after my friend and his dad's passing, we uh, began rehearsals for a local area Easter play. 
And I didn't know until we started rehearsing that year that I would portray the disciple John. Nor did I know that as John, one of my roles would involve taking Jesus down off the cross. And as I pulled the nails out of Jesus' hands and his feet, the blood from the spikes stained my hands and my clothes. And as Jesus was lowered onto my shoulders, I felt the weight of his body, and I brought him out into the middle of the stage. No one else around. Just me and Jesus. During one of our opening performances, it hit. It was as if I heard Jesus saying, Andrew, my heart breaks. But Jeremy is no longer a part of your life like he once was. He was a great friend. And he gave everything to save his dad's life and his own. I want you to know that there's no greater love than when a man lays his life down for his friend. And so Andrew, look down at your blood-stained hands and your clothes. You are my beloved sheep. And I love you. I came to die for you. I shed my blood for you. I died for your sins so that you would no longer be lost or hurt or broken. So that you can experience eternal life, true peace, and my great abiding love. stage, I realized just how great God's love really was. Out of my pain and my brokenness, I said, I'm sorry. Could you forgive me? And God responded, yes, Andrew. I forgive you. I love you. And I'm going to use you to tell my story. I never anticipated how much I had allowed my own grief to prevent God's healing in my life. But even in my pain, God still pursued. And in his perfect timing, he revealed his light of saving grace in my time of darkness. And when I received his grace, my heart experienced an overwhelming flood of true peace that through God's grace, one more sheep, one more lost sheep, had now been found, forgiven, and set free. Let's pray. Lord, all we like sheep have gone astray. Like sheep, sometimes we stray little by little, head to the ground, nibbling at all the things that surround us. And before we know it, look up. And we wonder, where are you? We wonder, have I gone too far? We wonder, how could a God love me so much after straying Yet, Lord, you pursue after us. We do not stop. Because we are your sheep. We are part of your flock. That you would be willing to leave 99 out in the wilderness. 
Stand and sing together our closing hymns. To God be the glory, verses 1 and 3, page 98.
Go in God's peace. And may the peace of God go with you this day. Amen. Amen. Amen.